Hi, I'm Randy Reed, the Executive Director of the National Lighting Bureau, and we are here today with Dr. David DeLaura and Terry McGowan to discuss the history of light. Gentlemen, welcome. What can you say about the history of light and lighting? Well, I think David ought to answer that. He wrote the book on it. You could say an awful lot. Uh, it's, you can look at it from the standpoint of the development of technology. You can look at it from a social standpoint, the effect that light and lighting has had on society and its development. Uh, you can look at it economically. Perhaps most people in the lighting industry are interested in the technology developments. Uh, you, can all, you can go all the way back to a world lit only by fire, which is an interesting thought. We take light and our ability to generate it for granted and to think that half a millennium ago, the only way you could see at night is if you had some flame. Uh, we've, <clears throat> we've come a long way since then. Perhaps uh, one of the most interesting things is to trace the history of lighting from the technologies that have been used to generate it from flames based on wax and wood and oils up through the uh, interesting development of gas lighting uh, over in England just at the turn of the 19th century and it spread throughout most of the urban areas in the world in, uh, in just a matter of a couple of decades. Uh, of course the big disruptive effect was the switch from gas lighting to electric lighting which uh, thanks to uh, Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison took place uh, simultaneously in Europe and in the United States. With the development of arc lights and discharge lights, we move into the modern era. Uh, it's interesting, most of us feel we're in the middle of a very disruptive period in lighting technology, and that's certainly true. The advent of LEDs has radically altered things. But to think back at history, the change from gas lighting to electrical, electric lighting was probably even more disruptive economically and socially. Yeah, give, give us some specific examples of that, if you will. Well, the, for gas lighting, there was an elaborate industry that had been built up. <clears throat> the technical foundation of that was chemistry and the physics of combustion. And gas was generated at huge stations, pumped through pipes, traveled through the streets, delivered to homes. When electric light came along, the people involved, men almost exclusively at that time, of course, uh, they came from an entirely different background. They were based on electricity. They were based on the technology of glass, <clears throat> wire, copper. And so the transition from gas lighting to electric lighting was not just technological, but it was also deeply social and commercial. And there was a shift from all kinds of people giving up influence, power, and income to new people earning their money by generating light in a completely different way. Would you say that glare was an issue with electric lighting that gas didn't have? And did the gas people use that against the electric people? I'm not aware of any explicit uh, commercial or, or uh, advertising that prompted glare, though one can look again at the history of lighting and see, for example, that the, the foundation of one of uh, our country's initial and important lighting companies, the Holofane Company, was right. based exclusively on the development of refractors that were designed to take the high luminance of electric light sources and spread it around. Um, you didn't lose lumens, you just spread them out over a larger area. So the luminance went down and the glare went down. So even that- Let, me, that, add, let me add a little bit to that because yeah. uh, some of that history was right here in Northern Ohio, I'm a Clevelander, and one of the very first electric lighting systems was down on public square when some arc lamps were posted, hoisted up in the air on top of 100 foot poles and a man by the name of Charles Brush did that for the first time. 
uh, when he first turned it on, he almost got put into jail because it scared the horses, not to say nothing of the people. But those were very bright. That's why they were 100 feet up in the air. And because they were carbon arcs, they had to be hoisted down again uh, to change the carbons because, they, of course, they burned away in a very short lamp life, we would say today. But that's what was the basis for a claim that Edison had with the incandescent lamp when he got around to putting that out. And his term was, I've subdivided light. In other words, he didn't have thousands of lumens that you hung up in the middle of a room and hope for the best. And glare was certainly there. You had a few lumens that replaced a gas flame that solved the problem of glare. So the gas people had nothing left to say. And in fact, if you look at a picture of a lighting showroom where lighting fixtures were sold, these showrooms went from selling gas fixtures to electric fixtures with nary a misstep, except for threading some wires through the pipes. Because mm -hmm. Edison had done such a great job of selling low output, low glare lighting with the new incandescent bulb. And with this job that you're speaking of in Cleveland, that was alternating current, correct? I don't know that that was alternating. Well, of course it was, because Charles Brush was an alternating current guy. But it was wind driven <laughs> on his estate, which was east of town up on a hill. He had a gigantic windmill made out of wood that generated this electricity that went on years after he left. But Charles Brush was famous for a lot of things and uh, certainly generating electricity as well as figuring out ways to use it was part of that whole story. And you mentioned the carbon filament was changed. What was the filament made of? What was it was old bamboo converted to carbon? The well, early, early incandescent lamps had uh, bamboo filaments. The, right. Of course, it's legendary. Uh, Edison's attempt to find a substance that would incandesce requiring very high temperatures but not oxidize. And so he stumbled upon uh, bamboo as a source of carbon and they would slice large bamboo into small strips, bake it in, uh, in, in graphite and you had a carbon filament that could withstand the temperature and incandesce but would last a reasonably long time few hundred hours. Okay. Uh, Terry, talk about the, um, the ages of light. And obviously, let's start with the first age of light out of darkness. Well, that's what we've been talking about in a way, because what Edison did, of course, um, was made a, a practical incandescent lamp uh, using carbon filaments to start, and then other materials ending up with tungsten as, as the best one, which is still in use today for the lamps that are still made. So it was, a, it was an age of rarity as far as lumens were concerned. It was very tough to generate lumens. You had to figure out a lot of things and the hot wire in a bottle became the, the kind of the catchphrase because we had to heat something very hot, like an old flame, except it couldn't burn out. It couldn't act like a fire. It had to remain on. And so lamp life from right from the beginning. So I, I just call it the age of incandescence because the lumens were expensive. They were hard to get. They needed an infrastructure, which of course Edison provided himself in New York City for some of the first installations. But then as we got to, to, to developing this idea, many companies, and again, Northern Ohio was a hotbed of that. There were more than a dozen companies making incandescent bulbs in this area and that became the, the really the foundation of the General Electric Company headquartered in Cleveland at a place called Neela Park, the first industrial park in the country. That was about 1913 and these companies consolidated to form the GE Lighting that we had of course as a lamp manufacturer for many many years. Uh, so that was the first stage of light. And that age went on until the 1940s when the development of the fluorescent lamp, which was primarily done at Neela Park, uh, made an appearance and all of a sudden the cost of the lumen went down dramatically. And that was something that with a tool that was a, a surface of light rather than a point or a filament of light, you could do things differently in your thinking. 
uh, maybe you could use a bare lamp and it wouldn't be glaring. Maybe you could just really install a whole ceiling full of fluorescent tubes and have a luminous surface for the first time that was not only uniform, but was white like daylight rather than warm like a candle flame. Right. So it, we, we it, experienced all of that over that first age moving into a second age of light, which was really an age of abundance. And tell us about the 100 foot candle club. Oh, yes. Well, the lumen got so inexpensive that electric utilities were kind of desperate to develop the idea of using more light, using more electricity uh, to enrich themselves as well as take up their generating capacity. So they promoted lighting as a way to do that. And one of the things, this was a Chicago utility, talked about was the 100 foot candle club. If you installed a commercial lighting system, an office say, and you put 100 foot candles at the desktops on the work plane, then you were a member of the 100 foot candle club. And that was something to behold. Uh, the phrase of the day was, we really wanted an office environment that felt like you were sitting underneath the shade of a tree on a sunny day. That was perfect. It was perfect from a glare standpoint. You had enough illumination to see your task perfectly. You could read a telephone book, for example, without errors. It was a wonderful environment to be in. And I remember seeing pictures that were taken out underneath uh, trees in a shady grove where people with, in desks that had been moved out there doing their office work to illustrate the point. And by golly, it was pretty good. From a visual standpoint, you really couldn't complain. But of course, the cost to do that, the energy cost to do that was fairly substantial. And that's where the problems began. There's an interesting anecdote about uh, the advent of the fluorescent lamp. The, some of the earliest work in lamps that were not yet commercial, but were used to discover the properties of the lamp, that work was taking place in England. Folks, yes. at, Neil, folks at Neela Park had heard about this, so they hired a number of people to inquire what was going on over in England. The report came back and said that lamps in the laboratory were exhibiting output of 38 lumens per watt. The folks back at General Electric thought that the fellow had misplaced the decimal point and that it should have been 3.8 lumens per watt because even that would have been a big step over incandescent. It was impossible to believe that they'd made a jump to 38 lumens per watt, which was, yeah, yeah, that was 10 times. Fluorescent. That was with fluorescent, correct? That was with the flu early fluorescent lamps. Remarkable. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the UK beat the US on the fluorescent lamps. No, the, the US was the first to provide commercial fluorescent lamps. Uh, General Electric did that. And those, uh, those lamps were actually at the World's Fair in 1939. Right. There were uh, er early fluorescent lamps were available in 1939. And then along came the Second World War, and fluorescent lamp production really did not uh, expand to a large extent until after the war ended. Okay, so Terry, you mentioned about all these companies in Cleveland during the first age of light. Then we kind of go to the second age of light. Can we talk about some of these companies and how it ended up kind of being the big three with GE, Sylvania, and Westinghouse and kind of the consolidation that took place. And who is Mazda? What is a Mazda lamp? Yeah, M Mazda was interesting. Uh, GE started that. Uh, th there were patent fights, there were business fights, there was consolidations, there was little companies consolidating into big companies, there was big money hidden away someplace. All of this was going on in that period uh, between uh, old, the, the late 1920s and of course uh, through the, the age of fluorescent down, down into the 40s and 50s. It got so bad that the antitrust people really started looking at the lighting industry. And I remember since I worked at GE Lighting for quite a few years that uh, the antitrust folks had us on such a tight leash that if we went to an IES meeting and sat down with a competitor around a table in a restaurant we had to fill out a form. We were not supposed to talk about all of these things that was going on because 
there was so much antitrust feeling at that time that these companies had really soaked up all of this technology and it were limiting it and charging too much for it. So uh, this was really a, quite a time of development and consolidation, as you, as you say. And that's when those big three companies, the Westinghouse, Sylvania, and GE, really ruled the roost. But they also, then it was to their benefit to develop the market. And that meant they did research. Neela Park, for example, did vision and glare research. Uh, people like uh, oh, Dr. Sylvester Guth, who I worked with for years, came up with a system for uh, rating glare and interior lighting systems. And there was much research, not just on products, but on seeing and visibility and color and all these things today that we have metrics for and kind of take for granted. But these were developed by the lamp companies. Sylvania had a wonderful group of scientists and, in the Boston area that did some remarkable work on color. And Westinghouse, of course, uh, uh, part of that, their outdoor lighting was in Cleveland, but uh, they were more in New Jersey. And so they became kind of the center of technology for a lot of offbeat light sources and really developing and refining the light sources that the others had developed as well. So it became a horse race. Every time a new lamp was developed, let's say the high pressure sodium lamp, that was developed by GE initially, but Westinghouse was right there. And Westinghouse got the city of New York to put their lamp in the street lighting system of New York City by tweaking it just slightly so that GE did not have a competitive product. It was really a very, very competitive time. And those three were at each other's throats for years upon end. So they found kind of a unique feature they could do with theirs that GE couldn't do and they got on the spec. Just like yes. we do, today. Just we, like we we do today. the same thing today, except it was only three people. Now it's 20 or 50. <laughs> oh, yeah. Too many. Too many. Okay, gentlemen, tell us, tell the audience a little bit about the third age of light. We started on that with the high pressure sodium. Yeah, it was the HIDs. Uh, and, and really, uh, I used to hear it called really the age of refinement. Essentially, what that meant was if you wanted to do a lighting project, interior, exterior, specialized in some way, there was a light source that was a perfect match to do that and technology that would let you do it inexpensively and, and with energy efficiency too. Because by the 1970s, when HID was really in its full-throated expansion, why energy efficiency had become important. We had the oil embargo of the 1970s, and this was really beginning to bear down on us. Little did we know that it would become a driver, the main driver of the, of the, of the industry for so many years. But we had incandescent, we had fluorescent, and we had HID light sources all competing as tools. And so out of this confusion really came the lighting designer. And GE will tell you that the reason that the lighting designer got a lot of impetus was one product development, and that was the MR16 halogen reflector lamp with the dichroic reflector, which was a dream tool for an interior lighting designer because it could be focused, it could give abundant illumination, it could light museums, it could light displays, it could light stores, it could light offices. It was a tremendously flexible light source. And GE even started what they call the Edison Awards that first concentrated on projects involving the MR16 and then broadened out, of course, to all kinds of other projects at the time when lighting designers were assembling themselves, were taking more and more work. And these wonderful people who thought about lighting day, night, and, and, and every way possible they were theatrical, and that's really where they came from. They were theater lighting people that turned their attention to the commercial, industrial, and outdoor parts of the world, worked with architects, and really became what we know today as the lighting design profession. So it was, it was an age of refinement, all right, and it, it set the stage for what we have today when we are, we are used to a great many tools to get the lighting job done. Uh, gentlemen, we've talked a lot about the past. Let's talk a little bit about the future. And Dave, talk to us a little bit about some of these self-luminous uh, luminaires and robotics and virtual reality. 
Very interesting. <clears throat> In the history of lighting, it has always been the task, if the job was either outdoor or indoor, to bring light to an object that was essentially, I'll call it, luminously passive. We saw it because it reflected light. And this was true of the roadway. It was true of the paper that was on an office desk. It was true of the piece of work that was on the metal lathe in the shop, was on the item on the assembly line. The object was to bring light to another object that reflected it and we made it visible. That was the job of lighting engineers and lighting designers. One of the most radical things to happen in the last 10 years were the widespread development <clears throat> and use of self-luminous sources, like the very screens that you and I are looking at right now. <clears throat> These sources, um, and they are light sources, have been uh, corralled, used to display information. And so we used to use paper and pencil and pens. We simply don't do that anymore. In the factory, we now have, in many industries, robots that do the work for us. Robotics doesn't require light because the robots don't need light to know where the gizmo is. They know where it is because they've been programmed to know that. This is a radical change in the very purpose for lighting. We're just now seeing the effects of this. And this is something that's going to become more important as the years go on. Earlier this year, Terry and I were in a meeting where we discussed this very thing. What's going to be the effect of self-luminous tasks in the lit environment where lighting's job no longer is to bring light down onto the desk. You don't have to do that anymore because what you're looking at is its own light. Lighting is going to shift away from tasks and become probably something more involved with the environment. How does the room look? What's the environment like? What are the surfaces like? Is lighting helping us navigate through buildings? All these issues that to some extent had been eclipsed by the race for efficiency may very well come back now and become prominent again. When you say self-illuminous tasks, you mean like a computer? Correct? Right. A computer screen, your cell phone, your iPad, your personal assistant, virtually everything that we use now in our daily work, specifically office work and even factory work, self-luminous. You don't have to bring light to it. As a matter of fact, if you bring a lot of light to it, you actually make it harder to see. Right. Okay. Understood. Tell our audience a little bit about lighting design with augmented reality and virtual reality, and what's the difference between the two? I'm going to predict that lighting design, as Terry described so eloquently just a few minutes ago, is going, to, is going to radically change because one of the things we're going to be able to do with the advent of advanced computers, very, very sophisticated computer programs, and very elaborate display technology is take lighting systems for a test drive. Even before the thought of making a mock-up, we're going to be able to put special headsets on our heads and see what the lighting system is going to be like. The virtual reality that I'm now describing is essentially that. You generate a reality, in this case, a luminous one, with the proper geometry, the proper spectrum, the proper placement, the proper luminance, and you put that in front of anybody. You don't have to be a lighting designer. You can be a client. You can be a worker. You can be anybody. And you can see what the lighting system is going to be like. Uh, Virtual reality then is going to become a very powerful design tool because we're going to be able to look at designs, look for the problems, make changes, and we're going to be able to do this at very little cost. Augmented reality, which requires a different kind of technology, is looking at something that actually is physically present and you put another layer of luminous information on it and that layer is provided 
by the gizmo that you're wearing on your head. I suspect that although um, that is an interesting thing to see, compared to what virtual reality is going to do, I think augmented reality will probably be more of a parlor trick than a useful tool. Very good. So gentlemen, as we talk about the history and it helps us to predict the future to some extent, let's take the year 2030. What would an office look like with regard to lighting in 2030? And will there even be offices in 2030? I bet there'll be offices. I, I'm, it's sort of fun now to imagine, well, okay, 10 years from now. 10 years from now, I think that if I'm still doing that, and I hope I'm not, but if I walk into an office because I've got work to do, I'll be able to sit down at the desk and input how old I am, the color of my skin, the work I'm about to do, and whether I go outside for a walk every day. And the lighting system is going to respond to that information and provide me. You stand on the walk. Why do you put that in about you're going for the walk? I think I know where you're going, but I'd like to hear it. Well, because that's where I get my circadian dose, right? 10 o'clock every day, I go outside and I walk for 40 minutes. I don't wear sunglasses and I get a good blast of light. And it helps us sleep. Yep, there you go, Terry. Right. That, that is the first circadian lamp. I just got it the other day. <laughs> it has a recipe built into it, so it gives me the proper spectrum and intensity during the daytime, and then it has a, a night mode that it goes to, removing the blue, for example, for evening, and of course it goes off at night. But there it is, the first one, and I absolutely agree with David on this, that that light and health and circadian rhythms will be very much a part of whatever kinds of spaces that we live in or work in because we will need to get that circadian entrainment for a lot of reasons involving health and well-being and mental ability. And we just don't know even how broad that field is, but it's certainly going to be there five years, 10 years, certainly, certainly reaching a, a, a very important demographic and also making possible productivity and also making possible new ways to think about lighting. On this circadian lamp that you just showed our audience, you mentioned about the uh, spectrum. How do you control that or is it automatic? Well, I, ca I can set in my, my pattern so that if I say have a, a, I work second shift maybe and so I have a different sleep wake cycle I can set it for that. But how? Normally, how? how? With a phone? On your computer? With an app? Oh, this particular one, you just turn a dial. Okay. But, but no Thank doubt you. there will be smart products, and there already are some, of course, that, uh, that you can do with an app on your phone or uh, by programming, just like a computer. How will our organizations help us evolve to this uh, wellness, well-designed buildings? Well, I don't know, David, what's your opinion on that? I, I feel that the, they're already there uh, making themselves felt, but they tend to be limited so far. It hasn't really trickled down to the apartment house, the college dormitory, the places like that where a lot of people work and live. I think it's, uh, it's only a matter of time and money. That's always been the case, hasn't it? I mean, since, yeah. since the age of the incandescent lamp, it's been a matter of time and money. Uh, the technology is, especially the controls technology, is advancing so rapidly and in such tight step with the development of the technology that generates the light itself that I think the kind of environment that we're now imagining is going to be commonplace. People will not want to rent an apartment or work in an office building in 10 years, say, that's a long time, actually, considering how rapidly lighting technology is changing. 10 years is a long time. Uh, in, in 10 years, people won't, they will refuse to rent an apartment that doesn't provide the kind of lighting that Terry describes, where it's responsive, it changes spectral composition, it changes uh, density, 
and, and amount. Those, those sorts of things. And this is an interesting, perhaps unintended consequence. Lighting will be driven to become a background commodity. People will simply expect it to be around and to be at our beck and call. And it will no longer be a very special thing that you expect to pay a lot of money for that's stuffed in the ceiling. I think you'll walk into places and you won't even know where the light's coming from. The technology is now such that the light sources are changing rapidly in their form and placement. And to me, that's a little bit of a worry because for our industry and for the uh, expectations we have of the respect and the attention lighting gets, you don't want it to become something like paper towels where you just go into the store and you grab paper towels off the shelf and you really don't care what you buy as long as it's paper towels. Uh, the, the commoditization of lighting is one of the consequences of the advanced technology, both in controls and lower costs. I might have to disagree with you on the paper towels because during the pandemic, I bought some cheap paper towels and toilet paper, just happy to have some, and my wife threw a fit. <laughs> thing. Okay, gentlemen, we're, we're in the age of solid state lighting. We all agree on that. And I'd say specifically, we are entering the well era of that uh, with what we're discussing, as well as with UV. In 10 years, what will our focus be? I could give you a pretty good prediction for five years, but 10 years, as you said, Randy, you get out into Never Never Land. <laughs> And that gets much harder because we don't know what will happen there. Uh, the UV germicidal lighting phase, which all of a sudden came upon us in March, and I've been in the middle of it, trying to figure out, you know, just how is UV germicidal going to fit in to get us through these next few months? How can we make interior spaces safer? Well, we already have some products now, for example, UV see emitting diodes, LEDs, if you will, that can make a room by proper application in that space as if it has outdoor air. Now, that's different. That would help spread, help the spread of the disease to limit the spread of that disease in a big way, in a very simple way, using products that look like uh, a smoke detector, for example, which was announced a couple of weeks ago. So, that's a game changer. And if you would asked me last fall, is that going to happen? Well, no. Who's going to be interested in UVC and putting it in a room? I mean, it's dangerous stuff. Well, as it turns out, yes, it's dangerous, but not if you use it properly. So things change like that. And predicting that 10 years ahead, wow. One of the things that's going to happen is we're going to discover more and more about what different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum are doing to us, the plants that we use for food, for the animals that we raise for food, and for things in our environment. And lighting is going to respond to the changes in what we come to understand are the effects of different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. In a way, one way to describe the kinds of activity that Terry just did is to say that lighting responds to the changing knowledge of our understanding of what the electromagnetic spectrum is going to do to us, plants, and animals. In a way, we're going to have to give up the word light because the connotation of that is visible. And in many cases, what we're now talking about are effect, effects that are non-visual. Uh, the fancy word is actinic effects. And uh, most people don't use that word, but both below the visible range of the spectrum and above the visible range of the spectrum, we're going to discover that lighting has a role in our lives that 10 years ago we couldn't have imagined. Yes, those are very wise words. And as a corollary to that, we're going to have a whole set of units to explain and understand those effects that we don't have today. So I think we can predict pretty reliably that the age of the foot candle is gone, the age of the lux is gone, and the age of new units is about to be upon us. Wow. 
That's pretty deep. I like that, Terry. David, any closing comments? It's been a pleasure to participate this morning, and I hope everyone has found this useful. Terry, closing comments? I, I love these exchanges, Randy, and I can't think of a better person than David DeLora to be online with here. Uh, I wish it could go on all day. <laughs>